So, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue this afternoon uh, with a full stomach, thank God. Uh, what is perhaps the hottest potato, may I say, in aviation in Europe? And um, I noticed capacity is the word that was mentioned more times, perhaps after IATA, just after IATA. So um, we're very lucky to have on stage Mr. Eamon Brennan, Director General of Eurocontrol. He's going to be the moderator for the session, and he'll be um, addressing the panel, saying a few words to explain the issue, and then addressing the panel. Thank you, Eamon. OK, thank you very much. So I, I prepared about three slides just to, to, to get the pre panel going and to deal with some of the tricky issues. So I suppose the first thing that's important to say is that welcome everybody back. Um, wh what I'm looking at here on the screen, if you have a quick look at, is the 7th of September this year, when 37,101 flights managed from Europe. And if you look at the bottom corner here, you can see the, or the, cl the clock here, you can see it. I, think, I don't know if you can actually see it. It is in the bottom left-hand corner. But what it indicates is that we had a really busy day on the 7th of September. So everybody's summer holidays were extending, but also um, people were back at work. And we're looking at you know, a day here where actually the system worked very well. Now, I have a point about this. The system worked very well on this day, even though it was our busiest day. And why was that? And the reason for this is because the summer holidays were over. People were back at work, air traffic controllers were working, people who should be in places they should be were there. So this was an interesting point, and I'll be de teasing this out with the panel um, th in, in a while. But you can also see that Europe is not just hub and spoke anymore. Europe is more point to point. So this is a, 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 an interesting observation. But when we look at the, the actual bad news from this summer, you can see that we have a target delay in our system of 0.5 minutes per flight. Now, that doesn't mean anything. What that really means is take the total flights, divide it by the total day, days, and you find that um, it's 0.5. We're doing 1.93. And what's interesting there, and it was brought out by successive speakers this morning, is we've got a capacity problem in Europe. So the capacity problem is basically broke down into, you know, looking at capacity and staffing, which is 59% and uh, disruptive events, which I love this is my nice Belgian word. In Ireland, we call it a strike, okay? And then we have weather, okay? So just to set the scene, there is a significant amount of this whole issue within the control of everybody in this room, within the control of ANSPs, within the control of states, within the control of, of, of everybody. But it's, qu it's quite significant. And just the third point I want to make to you is here's the 28th of July, 1700 on the 28th of July. Now, here's what's interesting about this day, is Europe is a small continent. It's not big. Compared to the United States, it's quite small. But here we had a situation where we had 301,000 minutes of delay, each minute of delay costing 100 euro. <coughs> but the interesting point about this is not, isn't actually that. What I want you to focus on here is that there were 461 network regulations on that day. So whether it's weather, whether it's strikes, whether it's capacity, whether it's disruptive events, inverted commas, who knows what. But the issue is, if you're EasyJet and you want to fly from Luton and you want to fly to Carfu, it's nearly impossible to wade your way through 461 different regulations. And to those of you in, in the room, if you're looking at a regulation, you're looking at basically something that's put on by local ATC, something that maybe is put on by the network manager, but we have to find a way through a system that's based on network regulations on one of the busiest day of the year. And as was indicated this morning, you know, by, by the commission, if you look, for instance, 20 million is our estimate of minutes of delay so far this year. So it's a real significant doubling of the problem in one short year. So the panel today is looking at trying to focus on these issues. And if you look at how it affects airlines, it's worth just looking for one minute there. No airline is immune from this. If you take the largest carrier, a non-network carrier, Ryanair, 31% of their flights are delayed. And if you move to, for instance, Swiss, you know, a network carrier, 34% of their flights are delayed. Thomas Cook, 35%. And each of these represents significant delays. And here's the point. Where there is a delay, it's not 0.5 minutes. 
where there is a delay, it generally averages more like 45 minutes to one hour. So those of you traveling this summer will know that this summer was one of the worst that we had in many, many years. And just to finish off, to talk about airports, seeing as we have Catherine here with us, Amsterdam, pretty tough summer. Barcelona, a pretty tough summer. Lisbon, a really bad summer, okay? And Ataturk and Gatwick and Heathrow and Palma and Zurich and Frankfurt. All of these things causing problems. So that basically is it as an introduction and as a generator of trying to cause the problem. So today I'm going to look at the problem in two areas. One in the short term. So first of all, I'm going to ask Maurice. Maurice, what's your reaction to what I just said? What do you think? Do you think it's good news? Good afternoon. I'm Maurice Georges, uh, Director of Air Navigation Services in France. I'm very happy to be in Madrid, which is a splendid city in which I have some friends. It's also a city where I'm quite happy to meet uh, friends from all over the world uh, many times, uh, in particular every March when we have the Global ATM uh, conference. And I also know that uh, all our friends from all over the world sometimes have difficulties to travel to Madrid due to ATC strife in France. So I think we are killing the subject. Madrid is a nice place to be, it's a nice place to travel to, but it's not always so easy to get there. It's not only the case of Madrid, but I'd like to point out. So, strikes, uh, capacity gap is really the, the dark side of our business. I would just like to mention also the white side of the business, which is less visible, is that air traffic controllers are a part of the aviation community. They love their job, they are working for its future. Uh, the fact is that uh, sometimes their job is difficult and uh, they have ways of demonstrating it, which is difficult for the entire aviation. Where are we today? We are in a situation where uh, traffic has been growing up uh, very fastly in the last, uh, the last years uh, with, uh, and with strong perspective for the next years. Uh, that for some reason that could be explainable, but I will be talking later. Uh, we are missing air traffic controllers uh, in the core area of Europe, not only France, but also Germany, uh, Maastricht and maybe other uh, NSP in the core of Europe. Uh, and this gap of capacity is creating a, a huge impact on, uh, on the regularity of the air traffic in, uh, in Europe. Uh, this is not satisfactory. This is something that we have to cope to. We are in a very important year uh, this year in preparing the next uh, European economic regulation phase. And we have to stabilize the situation where staffing should not be an issue for the coming uh, years when we have been recovering from where we are. Uh, it takes too long to uh, recruit and train in air traffic controllers to face uh, rapid changes. In France, like in Germany and other countries, we are recruiting a lot of controllers. We've been starting that uh, since years, since 2016, 2017, but the real actual positive impact uh, will not come uh, before the, the coming years. So, 2018 was difficult. So what about 2019? What about 2019? As for France, and I think some of my colleagues are in the same situation, uh, we will not uh, have a totally a recover in terms of uh, capacity because we are still uh, recruiting and training controllers, but uh, there will not be enough controllers to have a, a full capacity for the, for the next year. So it will still be difficult. Uh, the positive thing, and I think on which we have to build, and uh, thank you, Eman, for that, is that uh, we've been preparing summer 2018 uh, with Eurocontrol, network managers, UD Airlines, in trying to uh, adapt uh, a proper contingency plan. Uh, a first step has been made for summer 2018, and I think for summer 2019, we have to get a step further. Uh, in 2018, we have been focusing on the real core area, the, the Germany side, the, the Benelux side, uh, for this year, we also have to deal with other bottlenecks, especially the interface between Sp France and Spain. So we are preparing for that. Uh, we have to work on some structural routing, which will help for uh, adapt the situation. We also have to continue in implementing some more uh, flexible and tactical CDM processes. I definitely think that uh, we are still at the beginning of something which should be in place in the coming years is a real kind of uh, Google Maps system for aviation. We are lagging behind. We are still working with conference calls, with uh, filing uh, flight by flight. We need some more uh, agile CESAR solution to be able to be very reactive 
to fly uh, as we can fly, uh, considering all the, the situation. Very okay, good. Maurice, thanks. I'm Catherine, so this summer in Heathrow, I saw your name was on the map there. You, you were looking at then, you weren't top of the pile, but you were on the list of delayed airports in Europe. So what, what was your problem with this summer? Firstly, thank um, you very much for having me um, at the conference. I'm really um, overwhelmed to be here. It's great to um, for at an IATA conference to have an airport on the panel, so thank yep. you. Um, this summer uh, was regrettably probably our worst summer in history in terms of uh, air traffic delays. The days that you cited um, were hugely frustrating for us and the airline communities um, at Heathrow. We have 81 airlines flying in and out um, at Heathrow Airport and we have invested a huge amount of money the airlines, our investors, our, our shareholders, and the airport itself, over the last five years, we've invested over £40 million in ATM solutions and about £50 million in our APOC. And that investment is single-handedly getting wiped out by the problems in the wider network. And if we don't do something about this as a coalition, and that we, if we don't join up, and actually, this is for me an absolute call to arms here, then we are going to have, uh, pardon the vernacular, but piss that money up against a brick wall because we have gone from an 80.1% punk departure punctuality last year. Um, and we, if we are lucky, we'll finish this year at 77%. And that is entirely driven by network delay and weather which I believe, and I, I think everybody in this room firmly believes, is completely avoidable. Okay, so, so by network delay, Catherine, you mean other people not doing in what they're supposed to do in Absol other parts of Europe, is that what you mean? Absolutely, absolutely, and we need, we need more coordination, we need more, I think, centralised control from, from your organisation, Eamon, um, and we need legislation to drive that. At this point in time, I think we've heard a lot about it this morning. Um, there's, a, there's individual nations' agendas driving this, and we need to get behind one common um, objective and all be uh, pointing to the same outcomes. Thanks. Raphael, you represent IATA. All, all the great and the good of the airlines. We had your chairman here today. We had your DJ here. Okay, this is the worst summer that we've had in nearly 20 years. So, so what's your reaction to it, number one? And number two, what do you think we should do about it? Well, I think you, you um, first of all, uh, as representing IATA, earlier on we heard in the morning from our uh, CEOs, right? And, and from the airline side, or, you know, you can see how the airlines are, you know, uh, let's say, uh, confronting the challenges, right, to be able to, um, I would say, adapt to the necessary changes of, uh, of what's happening in, uh, in, the, in the context of Europe and to be able to cope with it. So they have done a good job in that sense, you heard okay. it before. Now, if we look at, the, at, the, at the how to go about it, obviously, you show earlier graph, and, and I guess, according to your numbers, you know, 80% of um, uh, uh, delays today. I mean, we are all above 80% of last year's already. So we're, everybody's talking about the summer. So we already know this problem. <laughs> okay, we know this. You know, it's an urgent problem. Um, I think uh, um, in 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 the side of the of the airline. I mean, obviously, this is a collective effort. It's a it's a value chain. I mean, a lot of us have. We all have to work together. Uh, definitely, um, you asked earlier about the short term. So in the short term. Yeah. I mean, if we talk about short terms, we know that we need to, uh, let's say, reform the labor or working conditions, let's say, you know, because we have a staffing issue. Okay, but let's, let's talk about that, Raphael. So we, we, point number two is reform outdated work practices. Okay, so what is that? You want air traffic controllers to work during the summer? Surely you can't be serious. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, yeah. I, I, well, we would like first at least uh, air traffic controllers to, uh, yeah, work during weekends. I mean, yeah, during weekends. Level. Okay, because, because I, I've noticed to be more the chart. I mean, you know, the weather is worse at the weekend. But I mean, w do you seriously? Is do I have to? Do we need to talk about this? Because it's the kind of elephant in the room. So we have a long summer period, and you know, social partners, staff in uh, in in ATC. We all we all need holidays. But you know, okay, if I'm making Christmas cakes, do I give the bakers the holiday? prior to Christmas. Well, what's your view well, on again, that? Well, again, it, you know, the, the, this is not about, I guess, uh, holidays or not holidays. Everybody yeah. has a job no, no, and we have to do it, right? It, yeah. So I, I think we all have different jobs, okay? Yeah. 
okay. if summer is our critical time in, in Europe, then we have to uh, staff our, our yeah. uh, uh, you know, the capacity in Europe to be able to cope with it, right? Yeah. So, uh, and, and that's, I think, very straightforward because the airlines do the same thing when they have to plan their flights for summer, right? I mean, sure. pilots don't take enough vacation probably, I don't know. But the, I'm not, you know, what I'm saying is uh, the, the practices have to be reviewed, right? We have to, uh, at the same time, be able to program accordingly to the, um, the projections and not, I mean, the, the, the initial ones were, we have seen a bit conservative, I guess. Okay. Right? So we now see a reality that Europe is growing, good. Um, but we haven't addressed, addressed that. We also have, uh, you know, it takes two years to be able to train an air traffic controller, right? So that's also a big challenge, right? Because then <laughs> we're talking about next summer, yeah. how we're going to be able to have enough if they're necessary, right? Okay, so th those points that you have here, yeah. you know, 25 uh, million minutes, you know, um, it's a huge amount. So, so who's paying for this? The airlines. Airlines are. So the uh. passenger, okay, fair enough. Thomas, can I move to you? You, 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 you've got a couple of slides here, so we're going to take them. But just before we take your slides, can I ask you a question? You're a, you're a big lobby group. You, you differ from IATA in that your, your mission in life, I think, is, if I understand it correctly, is to lobby on some key issues, okay? So here's a key issue. Um, air traffic is not working in Europe. Okay, we know that. This summer, you know, if we ever needed a lesson, it hasn't worked. So, so in your view, like, what are you going to do as a lobby group? How are you going to put pressure on the commission? How are you going to put pressure on, on the people who can make this happen? So, so what are you going to do? Mm. Uh, the obvious question, and, and thanks for some of the prep, uh, the prep conversation on this, uh, Raphael. Um, can, can we put the slide up? Yeah, that's, I think. Yes, just not up here, okay. Yeah, slide. Um, so, yes, we, we are a lobby group, and I think, uh, more interestingly, Airlines for Europe was set up as a, uh, you know, I think we reflect the market very well because we've got the largest LCCs on board in addition to some of the, some yeah. of the other members as well. Um, and this summer, it wasn't smoking, it was really burning. I mean, this is not a new issue, let's be honest. Traffic has been growing for a long time and delays have been increasing steadily. So um, the NSPs have known for a while that this was coming up and, and they all have had uh, different, different policies. I think we've seen also the um, an interesting slide this morning, which was talking about the charges and taxes. But let's not forget that in addition to that, the obviously I think it's fair to consider that ATM cost is still the largest cost for the operation of mm. the airlines, right? So when we see the 20%, you know, the ATM cost is on top of that. If we consider that now the fuel price, the transit of fuel price continue to go up, I mean, as a result, the pressure on all of the airlines, but also many, let's face it, of the medium to smaller sized airlines, the pressure will be on. We've seen uh, some bankruptcy, unfortunate bankruptcies earlier this summer, yeah. and this is mainly related to ATM cost uh, taxes and to some extent. Well, Thomas, I, I was listening to this this morning from Karsten and to an extent yeah. from Henrik, where there's little, you know, storm clouds gathering in aviation, little worry about overcapacity by aviation. Now, if we recall, we've always been saved in this industry by a recession. In 2001, Madam Palazzo, we were rescued by the, by the recession of 9-11. In 2008, we were rescued by the currency crisis. Are, surely we're not banking on somebody big going bust, taking capacity out of the system, and then we're okay for a few years again. No, have, we not, have we not got past this? No, no, I think, I think as a sector, I think it was very clear this morning, we're, we're in trouble. We really need to fix this. And the, uh, the instances you mentioned, you know, obviously we cannot hope for an economic crisis yeah. to temporarily solve the problem. So the trend is upward in terms of growth, three, four yeah. percent. So I think you, you, you've been very vocal on giving us these numbers, which is great. So that's positive. You know? So let's, that's a positive thing. The problem is we do have an infrastructure problem and it's not going, it's not going to go away. And for us from A4E, when we look at our, our lobby plans or advocacy plans for next year, ATM, which used to be somewhere in the top four, is now top number one. Okay. Right? So the challenges we have as a lobby organization is let's consider CES 2 Plus or whatever we may call it, the legislative initiative. Okay. Even if everything goes well with the results of the wise persons group and the results of the, um, uh, the, um, the airspace infrastructure study, that's all well. These are well steps. Mm. But in terms of final legislation, we're looking at three, four years before we see actually an impact of that. So the P&L guys are all on over us, and some of them you've seen on stage this morning. That's all fine, Thomas, but what are you going to do by next summer? We don't want to see the same disruption. And so what we decided, and I just, this slide just shows the cost, 
before I get to uh, the answer to your question, the cost. You, you talked about the delays, and, uh, and I think you showed the list of, of, of airlines which were more affected. I think about 10 of the 15 A4E airlines were also impacted by delays. This is the cost figure. So almost half of the cost, or well, a little bit less than half of the cost, uh, this is January till September or August. Uh, this is the cost of, um, your, yeah, of, your of ATC, and again, that's, that's, that's your, your figures. So it's that, it's not only delays, but it's that thing, that number, okay, but Thomas, these Thomas, numbers. Thomas, you're an unusual business. I, I've been in this business 25 years, and I used to be on the route charges committee. So if you're not getting the service, why do you keep paying for it? Well, that's an actually good point. I mean, we need to move to a performance, a I mean, performance if you buy based, a pay as you go. I think, I personally, I would argue, long term, we don't have it in our declaration yet, but as a, as a customer, yeah. you're looking at a supplier and you want a service, yes. right? You pay, if you pay for a service, you want a service. So if we're not flying, we shouldn't be paying for it. For whatever reason, we shouldn't be paying for it. I think that's the trend, and I think we actually are asking for a performance-based service. Okay. If there's no service, we don't pay. Right. Right. Um, now, I think that is we're moving towards this. The the positive thing um, is that, um, and that could be the next slide, is that last last next week. Next slide, if you can. Yeah. Last yeah. week we had an event uh, in Brussels where we we have actually uh, have consults with the NSPs, uh, yourself, Eurocontrol, uh, and the airspace users um, sign um, our airspace efficiency declaration. Great. Now you could say, yeah, it's another declaration. Yeah, but we, I, I pay, we, we can paper the wall with declarations and we've, we've, reports we've and working groups. It's, yes, but you, as you know, A4, A4E is, is not about just the paper, it's just getting things done, as you know. Okay. So it's on, it's on, it is on paper. Um, there are specific steps on paper which my team, and the good news is uh, the uh, Canzo, uh, Eurocontrol and the airspace users, and you know, we, we hope that the ATA, because the points you mentioned are very different, that would join us signing this declaration. The good thing is that we have the relevant stakeholders now around the table okay. uh, to look at mid to short to midterm solutions, because the European Commission has doing a good job, has, has a challenge of the next single European sky legislation, that's one thing, but that's long term for PNL leaders. Short term, these are a number of, of um, issues we've actually um, uh, pointed out in the declaration. Uh, and the good news, of course, is that for you, the, the Eurocontrol network manager's role is for us central. Uh, the commitment to a network driven approach, so let's not solve an issue here and there if it actually is impacting the entire network. And this is where, of course, Eurocontrol is very well positioned to, uh, to, to, to manage things. So, really, we're going to be, I mean, this is uh, really our our mandate and in our um, on the table with us uh, looking at uh, uh, at our jobs and uh, uh, at our careers next year is we we need to work these bullets and we're working up with Canzo again with your Eurocontrol and um, <coughs> and the airspace users to make okay. it work. Uh, Nicholas, you're Mr. Technology here. So so how can you you know you're you're in business for the last three or four years producing projects, delivering stuff and all this and you're you're well funded. Okay. What can you deliver in the short term to get us out of this? I mean, what do you see as what STM can help in the short term? Because I'm trying to focus on next summer before we move on to long term. I'll get you in the next one, but what can you do for next summer? So thank you, Eamon, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, indeed, uh, I believe that uh, technology certainly has to take its share to help this situation and this capacity crunch. Uh, as you rightly mentioned, it's already four years that Cesar Deployment Manager is operating and implementing uh, the Cesar solution, rolling out in the field wherever in Europe. Um, I have figures I can share, but I don't want to bother the audience, but we have facts and figures which show that Cesar deployment is happening, is ongoing, huge investments are going on. But are you delivering capacity? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm coming to your point, Eamon. But um, so this huge investment is a reality, uh, massively supported by uh, EU uh, grounds. Uh, now, uh, the perception, and I see that in every forum I go, in particular since summer, uh, there is perception that despite these uh, factual investments, nothing is happening, nothing is changing, and where are these benefits that have been announced by Cesar years ago that are about to resolve everything? We are not yet there, I must admit that, but what I want to stress and to answer your question, Eamon, is that some of the early results are there out of the 350 projects which are going impl in, in implementation these days in Europe, 80 now are completed, and some of them, in particular 20, are under close monitoring to confirm 
that this year they are bringing already some tangible benefits. And it's not data by SDM, it's data which are collected by network manager and by some airlines. Broad figure is to say it's about 200 million investments completed who have already brought bro bro this year 50 million euro benefits. Maybe it's nothing, maybe it's a drop. I'm aware of that, but what I want to say is that in particular, uh, and taking advantage, we have ISRO in the panel, PBN as ISRO is one of the uh, nice examples I want to quote. Also, some early implementation of free route is bringing obvious, tangible, uh, uh, quantifiable uh, benefits. My regret is that indeed last summer in particular, the situation was so uh, difficult that these early benefits really from Cesar, from technology have been lost in the background noise. Now, deployment... But, but maybe maybe they're getting lost because we're, we're not seeing a delivery. I mean, what do you think? I mean, if, if we're looking to increase capacity for next summer, is, is the worry I've got in the short term. Have you any kind of quick wins that you could advise here what we could do for next summer? You know, because well, I think it's important we focus on that. We, we, we have to be realist and pragmatic. Uh, technology has a certain life cycle and we, we cannot speed up uh, just because of what happened last summer. Things are on track, things are happening, are delivering. Some very early, small, but tangible benefits are there. This is a stepping stone on which we are going to build in order to bring more and more benefits, in okay. particular capacity, every next year, in particular okay, next so summer. Okay, so if I could move on, move on to the next question. To, I'll keep you on the, on the spot here, Nicholas, as I've got you. Okay, five years' time. How much extra capacity, okay. as a percentage to, of today, will SDM deliver to the system? So let, let's imagine we're five years' time, technology. What are you going to deliver? Of course, if you extend the horizon... Percentage-wise. ...the next five years, yeah. then we have a very important deadline in the next five years, in particular 2022, which is free route. Yeah. And I believe this is where a real breakthrough will be provided by Cesar from the technological side, okay. the network manager, from the operational side. So to answer your question, this is where I see a real breakthrough that everybody will perceive and will recognize as a Cesar benefit. Okay, okay, well done, Nicholas. Thomas, can I, can I, can I come back to you for a second? I'm not gonna just come straight up. Uh, I, I, I want to deal with the, the issue is that if you're, if you're listening to everybody in the panel, if you're listening to ANSPs and if you're listening to airports and Alexander de Juniac, you know, basically they all spend their time whinging about the commission. Commission hasn't got proper regulations about this. Commission doesn't do this. Commission doesn't do that. Do you not think it's time that actually the airlines grabbed uh, uh, the lead in this and started actually trying to help the implementation of, of a single European sky and actually help the Commission out? Well, I, I think you're, you're, you're right to a certain extent. I mean, the, the EU and, and the Commission is a driver uh, for a very often what I would call a harmonized approach to single European skies. Uh, is a good is certainly a good initiative so we we do need a commission but uh, again if you talk to uh, ops people and 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 business people who see that things don't properly work today or not even tomorrow then um, you need to um, and that's what we're trying to do you need to work with the people in the field i mean the nsps council we've been talking with council for a while actually since we were started up to really talk about okay let's sit down let's understand yeah. with people like maurice what can practically be done in France? What can be practically done about Karlsruhe? What can be practically done X, Y, Z? And I think uh, the also <laughs> the delay numbers. I think this summer has been very useful for a reality check for for all. Okay. And I think I, I think so. The realization with an increasing number of ANSPs, and I think the fact that Council has signed co-signed a declaration is a sign that at least you know we admit there is a problem. Everyone, not just the airlines, and but it's up to the airlines. To your point, to work with. Yes, with the Commission, but to work with the NSPs individually. Okay, Thomas, you posed a very good question, so you saved me asking it, so I'm going to ask Maurice it. I'll just relay the question on. So what can we do about Marseille? <laughs> Marseille is not the only problem. No, but, no, but let's, let's deal with this question. <laughs> no, okay. so, so just no, let's no, tell me what you're going to no, do about Kelly, Marseille. I, I would like to, to come back uh, on uh, one okay, thing. Okay, perfect. About free route. Um, if you declare free route like an airspace project, uh, you don't create capacity, you kill capacity. You create only uh, unforeseenable uh, bottlenecks. Free route is a real concept which is providing capacity and efficiency if you have a, a strong technological uh, backup there. And that's why we need Cesar. But we need a two-fold two Cesar, a two-fold Cesar. One, which is a, 
a strong uh, safety critical, resilient, cyber secure uh, infrastructure. And this infrastructure has to be interconnected uh, in Europe through CESAR, but also through you, Eurocontrol. We need to work on uh, a common uh, data architecture. And on the basis of this critical infrastructure, then we can provide value-added flexible solution. And uh, so maybe you don't see directly the, the output of the infrastructure, mm -hmm. because if you have the infrastructure without the, uh, the operational solution, you don't, get, you don't get nothing. OK, but can you, can you, can you I, I accept that. But maybe just the, the tricky issue, the issue that Thomas raised for, say, for say Marseille. It's, I, understand, I don't put you on too much of a spot. It's a difficult no, but situation. I, but I was but, to talk about Marseille. I was, my plan about Marseille is, first of all, uh, not have one year again in the same uh, social, uh, social uh, adverse context. Yes. With the strike uh, during two, uh, two, two or three months every weekend, it was a nightmare for you, the airline. But it was a nightmare also for everyone in the SNA. And I would say it was also a nightmare for most of the air traffic controllers. We have some uh, union election in uh, one month. And I think that the fact that we have been strong, all of us, is not uh, giving what they want, will create a positive output of this election. But this is uh, social democracy. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> <That's>, uh, <laughs> OK. I, I okay. cross my finger. Oh, take it. Uh, yeah. Secondly, secondly yeah. I, think I, I, I say that we are, in, uh, implement, we are um, building new technical infrastructure and we are qualifying new controllers, but this will not be solved uh, as from next year. That's why, as I say, I need you and I need my Spanish colleague to work with us, and we have to implement a network strategy which is dedicated to, uh, to the interface between uh, south of France and Spain and Italy to deal uh, for the network next year the same way we done uh, for uh, Maastricht and uh, yes. Eurotelia. And that's, I think, the most positive thing that we can do for next summer. No, I think that's sure, uh, okay. okay, well done. Raphael, so I, I, I have a great admiration for, for IATA because no matter what happens, you know, you, you pay for your control, thank you very much. You pay for all the ANSPs, thank you very much. You pay a lot of the contributions to Cesar, your help with the Cesar DM, many of your members are there, you know? So, so you keep paying and involved in every single thing. But, but what are you getting at the end of the day? Are you happy we're closer to a single European sky? Because I want to bring you back to 1963, the original vision of a European sky, a centre in Karlsruhe, a centre in Shannon in my own country, a centre in Italy, everybody signed up to this. So in 60, 70 years, we've gone significantly backwards. But how do you see it evolve in the next five years? See, you, see you're the guy who pays for everything. And you're very well, happy, apparently. You're apparent. right. First of all, every, uh, yeah, the airlines are paying for it, and the delivery is not there. Uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's definitely clear. And are you uh, happy to keep paying and not getting delivery? We're not getting delivery. I, I would say you already heard from, from uh, Carson Sport before. Yeah. I mean, we should uh, obviously look for single European sky. Right now, you said what well, we can do in five years. If we haven't done single European sky so far, obviously we need to push for it. In the meantime, yeah. there are actions that we need to take to 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 tackle. But, but is challenge. it? But is a single European sky a fantasy? I've, it's quoted to me as a kind of a thing in the sky up there. I mean, how, what what do you see a single European sky? What does it look like? For well, if you're in, you're the airline, you're the guy who's paying the bill. What what do you want? The the uh, well, if if we look at the holistic way, what we said before, why do we have steel borders up there, right? So we don't we would like to be able to move in the yeah. air as we are moving today, in the ground, right? Without yeah. without having those borders, right? Which was the aim of the single European sky. But in in terms of what we can do, obviously in five years, you already touch on technology, which is not there. We already touched on, on uh, the need to empower the network manager to be able to configure the, the network, um, you know, to be able okay. to cope with demand. We, we spoke about uh, the need to reform our basic work practices, right? Because now we're facing, you know, so these are basic things that... But, but, there's, but there's nothing new there, Raphael. If I made this list five years ago, I would have come up with the same yeah. list. I mean, reform, ATM, mobility, all of these things. So, like, what do we need to do to give it a shot? I mean, we're in a crisis this summer, so we accept we have a problem. So, you know the old saying, you should never lose a good crisis? What, what, what extra can we do this winter to prevent it happening again next summer or maybe in the next four or five years? Uh, we don't have a choice but to work together as an industry, right? Okay. And work together without borders, meaning, you know, sure. there was something mentioned with, by Maurice with, in terms yeah, of Maurice and collaboration between Good. Spain and France. But, yeah, that's, that's obvious. But we need to take some 
uh, difficult decisions, I would say, right? Okay. Because we keep talking about it, but the customers are the ones, we talk about these minutes. Here's the one taking But then the you, you, you should go take pictures of, I guess, Heathrow in summer. Yeah. And see how customers felt. Uh, okay. Can, can, I, can I turn just to Catherine for just a, mi a, a, a minute there? We're, we're looking at 20 years growth. That's the title of this panel, okay? So you, you've managed to come up with the, probably the largest infrastructure, the most expensive single runway ever proposed in Europe, okay? So how, how are you going to bring this and what capacity? I mean, is it a realistic proposition for Heathrow to add a second runway? Um, I know you're going to say yes, but at such a huge cost. I mean, where's the value in this? So it's absolutely um, our ambition to deliver the third runway and to deliver it affordably. So we recognize that the feedback we've had from all of our partners is that our original proposals were um, unaffordable and uh, we've been working hard with them to drive um, the, the cost down. So, but we need airspace change in the UK as well. And as you're okay. aware, the two programs uh, are running in parallel to each other. So we need um, the UK government and the CAA and NATS and uh, all of the lobby groups to come together in order to deliver that airspace change, or we will have a very expensive uh, strip of tarmac in the west of London. And that is a risk at the moment. Um, we are absolutely committed to the growth ambition that we have. So at the moment, you're probably aware, we uh, have a, a, a cap uh, of uh, 480,000 mm -hmm. uh, movements, and our ambition is to grow that uh, cap to 740,000 movements. But we can only do that if we come together in Europe and continue to drive the CESAR program in the way that's um, been described. I see the next 20 years, a massive challenge is um, how do we embrace technology as an industry? I think we're quite backward as an industry. Um, we, uh, if I think about ACCOs and ANSPs, we should be thinking of a world where actually there are very few humans doing that and it's all um, technology driven. Okay. Um, the, in the short term resourcing models, uh, I think Raphael mentioned, uh, we have we offer uh, extended leave breaks during quiet times and we incentivize um, people to come to work during um, the busy peaks, whether okay. that's summer or winter. I don't see any of that happening in at ANSPs um, across well, the Well, it probably does happen, but they, 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 they require a lot of money. So, Nicholas, can I turn to you quickly? How do you see technology solve this problem? Just, just look on five years, okay? So, in, in kind of 90 seconds, Tell everybody here how we're going to solve this with and what's technology's aspect. I believe the, the technology is there, or almost there. We have few cases still in validation in the SD, okay. but for what we want to achieve, let's be clear, most of the technology is there, ready to be deployed. No, but I let's be clear, what we want to achieve is to go from A to B, fast, yeah. cheap, safe. Now, but what has to be said clearly is that the new technology validated by Cesar, most of them, at least the most critical one, the one to support initial swim, initial 4D, cannot be deployed the way we deployed before. Mm. We have a kind of organizational crunch. We have to reinvent program management. We have to reinvent project management. And we want to work together on mm. that as the MSO. No, we will, we will, we will. I, I really believe this is where we have a challenge to meet because the technology is there. Most of the solutions are already on the shelf waiting to be put in the field and deliver their benefits. And this is where in the coming years now we have to put our effort because for the time being, a lot of things are ongoing. As I said, there are okay, the baseline for Cesar, but then the real core Cesar is still to be rolled out. And I believe that's really the part that will answer your question. And in the, the next five years, will bring the expected benefits at the end okay. and result in particular the capacity. If I may, and sorry. Yeah, but you, you, I, never gave me, you never gave me the percentage I was looking for. No, 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 I'm you sorry. I, I did not come to with, a, with percentage in particular. And I doubt anybody would be aware uh, on a realistic manner to put a percentage to say technology with resolve this percentage of okay. capacity. At least me, I would not believe anybody saying that. But, but, uh, but, 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 but because but, as Maurice said, yeah. technology it's important. Can, you cannot, you cannot um, uh, just um, look at technology in isolation. Uh, we, are, we are deploying enablers. Okay. And then you have to, to encapsulate this enabler in an operational concept. 
and this is the result which delivers okay. the benefit. Thanks, Raphael. Can I just pick you, pick you up on his point there? So the network, okay. Nicholas is talking about you've got to develop technology within a network concept. W what do you see the role of the network manager, or what can the network manager do in the next few years, the next five years? Look at the outlook. What way would you like to see the network well, manager evolve? Well, I think I, I think it was said, or I, I said it. I mean, say it very simply, we would like to be able to have an empowered network manager, right? If he that that looking at you know the projections that we already have to be able to actually. Um, um, be able to take the measures to be able to have the network ready to be able to absorb that kind of traffic that we are planning, right? Okay. And, and that, you know, uh, and, 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 and I think we don't have that now, right? Yeah. So I think it's, it's a very maybe simple statement, yeah. but we have to get it done. I mean, we are, we, again, one of the things you keep asking about percentages and things like that, and, and, and for example, if I think about it, the, the performance schemes, you know, we are three times worse than what it was agreed. So why did we agree to those numbers if we're not delivering on them? So okay. again, we, okay. we, there are basic stuff that we need to be looking at and, and, yeah. and, and, and solving them. And, and, you know, we're looking at the long term, which we agree on the, on the single European sky, but short terms, there are certain actions that we can take to, to mitigate. Okay, so, so, so Thomas, thanks, Rafael. If, 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 can I ask you a tricky question? So say in the morning that we, 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 we gave you Maurice's job, okay? You know, you're, in sorry, I didn't get. In the morning, we're going to give you Maurice's job. Yeah. Okay, what, what would you? What would you? Low do paid and compare. What, to the what would be the top three things you do in your first year? Learn French, I think. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. French. That's number four. <laughs> the beginning. He does not want. Yeah. And then, and, then, and, then, <laughs> and then, and then, secondly, use my uh, my uh, my talent as a as a true Belgian for compromise. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean it's it's a it's a tough job. Yeah. It um, is. So. Uh, you'll admit it that's that's again why why we decided rather than to talk to each other let's talk yeah. with each other i mean there is we have no choice but and also airports are part of yeah. that should be part but of i mean that. everybody knows what you know if you're if you're talking in the corridors you know you won't say it on the stage but maurice mm. needs to go down there and kick ass in marseille yeah. and blah 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 but but that's not realistic yeah. you can't do that i mean i would I like do i do it yeah, he no he does do it but, but I'm, I mean, I'm not successful not <laughs> 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 yeah. but, but what i think you do? i th i think um okay so if you uh, I, and I think it was touched upon this morning with some of the yeah. CEOs. It, when we when we talk about the value chain, I'm not trying to avoid the answer to the question. I think I'll I'll get to it. When you look at the value, no, but you're chain, trying to run down the clock. Well, when 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 you look at the value chain, there's basically uh, airlines are competitive. At least it's been liberalised thanks to the Commission. Okay. And you could argue to some extent that the OEMs, okay, that there is competition. You know, some may argue it's a duopoly, but let's not have the discussion. Okay. I mean, there is sufficient offer in terms of of technologies to buy, and we've got two bottlenecks, which is airports and ANSPs. Bottlenecks and don't why for the sake of bottlenecks. It's not, you know, it's, I don't consider it as a, a dirty and awful word. It is just a mindset which is different. So airlines are operating in a competitive environment. It used to be different, but today competitive environment. They have to work for the shareholders. They have to make money, not yes. just revenue. They have to make profits and not profits. And so so is, keep is, your, is your answer basically that you, you go the Italian and the British model and Y y you look for I a think wider private I think sector involvement. I think what I'd like to see at the NSPs is a change of mindset, okay. which is based on performance. What do I need to do to serve the customer? Yeah. At the end of the day, to serve the customer. And you could have the same argument with some airports. That's a different story. But, no, but it's, it's a change of mindset. And I think we need to find, and that's why we talk about seamless, uh, seamless European sky. The governments and national governments, because again, NSPs, they they work for, uh, for the national governments. Uh -huh. they need to we need to be able to, f to create a win-win. Yeah. And the commission would say, of course there's a win-win. You know, it should be good for everyone. The problem is that today, still too many national governments think in a national context. And yes. you've got the defense guys on top of that. So it's not an easy job. The defense guys reserve yeah. big parts of the spectrum. Country where I live in Benelux, it's ridiculous. You know, the small corridor you have for commercial aviation. So. Uh, my point is, we, we need to politically, we need to create, we need to uh, create a win-win for, I would say, f you know, the larger countries that actually dictate the European airspace okay. in Europe. Create a win-win, and then have at the same time a change of mindset. So the NSP, yes, you need to make money. We're not going to fund you just yeah. like that. If you have a problem, you need to make money. You need to look after but, your but own shareholders. But Thomas, to, to, to Raphael, to be fair to the NSPs... It's hugely challenging. I mean, yeah. it's not going to do. Every, every time they do make money, you guys come back and want the, the traffic reassessed. So you're looking for performance on one hand, 
you're looking for capacity on one hand, but you're into micromanagement of the business of the ANSPs. Maybe you should guy, guys should be more output focused. I mean, you know, if you agree a price with Maurice, if Marie, Maurice makes 10 million, what's the problem to you? Well, I think we wouldn't be having this discussion if we had the performance. Right. Okay. So. Okay. That's that's fair enough. But fair enough. Okay, Catherine, can I turn to you? So, so Heathrow, in 20 years' time, what's it going to look like? Because that's what we're supposed to be focusing on in 20-year time, and we're still bogged down in 2019. What's it going to look like in 20 years' time? Well, we'll still have a lot of our um, ex the infrastructure. You have the new be runway built. Through. We'll have a new runway built. We we may have a new terminal. That's yeah. still to be decided. But um, we will, as an airport, have fundamentally shifted the way that we operate. So capacity constraints are not just in the air, but also on the ground. Okay. And we have got a lot of work to do to change um, the way our industry runs. And when I say industry, I mean the airports and the airlines alike in the way that we, uh, the, the operational uh, model works within the airport. At the okay. moment, there's a lot of custom and practice, there's a lot of 1950s processes still in place, and we need to involve that. So we get to the concept, and I'm going to use a word if there's any uh, IEG colleagues in the room that they will be familiar with, of um, sort of dark terminals where there okay. are fewer touch points and we're therefore really sweating the existing assets and infrastructure. So can, can, can you give me in one minute how you think Brexit's going to affect Heathrow? God only knows. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that, that's fair enough. I got to turn to, I got to, got to we, 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 we tried. Okay, I've got to turn to to to, to Maurice. Maurice, you've got a, you've got one of the largest states in Europe. You've got five air traffic centres. You know, technology. We're talking about technology. How many? I mean, we know we don't need five, but you've got historic growth and all this kind of things and, and problems. How do you see France in 20 years' time? How, how would you see DSNA in 20 years' time, delivering? a good service, cost effective, but, but, but how do you generally see it organized culturally, mindset wise, you know, what would you think? Frankly, I don't know what this and will be in 20 years old. In 20 years later, yeah. the, only, the only thing I fear is that the SNA will be exactly the same as it is today. That's okay. something that we have to change and we have, to get, we have to get on the track. And I think th this track is already paved, but we have to get further. And this track actually is three lanes. The first lane is technology and CESAR, and I think all the components are there. We have uh, some uh, tools, we have uh, some roadmaps, we have some uh, obligation, we have some funding. There are one thing which is missing for me is that we have to take care uh, about two issues. We have to reinforce what we are doing in terms of interoperability between the, the, the different uh, systems, because we will have several industrial branches, and we have to secure that we have a full interoperability. And we are also to take care about the future challenges about uh, cyber security and uh, resilience, because the traffic is growing and the system is more and more sensitive mm -hmm. to any kind of technical disruption. Okay. And I think in Cesar we have to invest a little bit so, more So, Marie, Maurice. The second thing yeah, is with you. The second with thing is with you. Well, I why are you blaming me? I I'm only asking the question. I've it never no, had no, this no, chance no, in my life before. No, 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 <laughs> we're paneling together. <laughs> I think with Euro Control, yeah. uh, we are very good in uh, managing contingency. Yes. But this is not enough. Okay. And we have to transform our way to working together in how to manage. Uh, if we want free route, we have to define how to manage it. Okay. And it will not only be empowerment of uh, Euro Control or so on, maybe there is some part of that. It's also about what will be the, the most proactive process that we can implement with the airline. Okay. What will be the future flight plan and how we will process the okay. flight plan? What will be the, the, the tools for that? What will be the swim infrastructure? And this is something for me which is not totally defined within the Cesar roadmap because we need the network perspective okay. for that. And the third lane uh, on which we have to work to, uh, to progress and to transform, is as far as I know, there is no political will to create one single ANSP in Europe as it could be in the US FAA. So I think for a long time there will be several NSP and uh, more or less national, more or less privatized, but there will be some NSP yeah. which will have to develop their own business plan. Maurice, and this business plan, I ask you it to is not in 20 years, it's okay. right now. But and I think we are in a good develop. process with ISA, yeah. and I think 
if we want to prepare a future economic regulation period in which we put on the table the right objective in terms of performance, in terms of uh, cost, but also in terms of uh, planning resources, in terms of uh, any kind of uh, tool to that, we have to work together and to propose a joint, uh, a joint um, strategy to the regulator. I okay. Think, uh, so far, but the regulation has but been Maurice, much Maurice, prepared. Uh, yes. take, a, take a boat in here yeah. for a minute. This is all well and good, but if you take the every time the Commission come along and say we want a single level of upper airspace, A4E wanted all over Europe, all the NSP said no, 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 no. This is national, can't do this. So if we're if we're to make Europe more efficient, if we manage the upper airspace as one as a continuum at least or something like that. I mean, do you think we could get past the psychological boundary of doing this? Because we have a single currency, we have a single agricultural policy, pharmaceutical, roads. Wh why can't we do it in the upper airspace? Well, like, make quickly, you're what do you think? Well, you perfectly know that it's not so easy to cut the, cut the cake. Uh, sometimes it slices like that, yeah. sometimes it slices like that. I think we have to build on what we are, and we know that we also to interconnect with the airport. Yeah. And so I know that Eurocontrol is managing one upper airspace uh, center. Yeah. Uh, but this is not enough, as far as we don't enlarge it as, as one single... Uh, no, no, it doesn't have to be, but I'm just saying as a continuum. I mean, yeah. Raphael, what do you think about that? I mean, should we have European upper airspace? Well, I think, I think that is... I mean, you've got a European currency. Sorry? You've oh. got a European currency. Yeah, well, I, I think it's actually part of the single European sky vision, right? It was, it was, it was part of the, Euro uh, the single European sky vision to have. Yeah. A, a seamless, uh, I guess, uh, upper space, right? Yeah, it's it's one part of it. But but I mean, but are you are you guys in favor of it? Sorry, are you in favor of it? Yeah, I, mean, I think we are in favor because we it will it does support going towards the single European Sky initiative, which is at the end you ask us long term, twenty years and so okay. on, to 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 achieve, right? Okay, um, Thomas, can I can I just move on to to A A four E? You, you had a very successful event in Brussels last week. You brought it. You brought everybody together, and it was useful. I mean, I have to say, mm. it, it, it it was good. But what's the, what's the next step? So well, who, who do you expect to do? So we all we all signed up that day, and we all went off home. Oh ah, well, you That's signed something. No, no, no. You, you, I said you didn't personally. That's before. A4E off my back for another <laughs> few weeks, okay? But what yeah. actually happens? What 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 do you expect to happen? Well, what will happen concretely is we'll, um, uh, we'll go bullet by bullet, and we work the bullets. Uh, yeah. I mean, one, of th one of the bullets it has is that, uh, uh, as the European Commission promised um, in December, um, the Council, uh, the, the ministerial meeting in December, uh, to have um, Single European Sky on the table, at the lunch table, I believe. And yeah. Commissioner Bolsch is very but adamant but you're, you're that this will happen. But you're back to this demanding the Commission do things again. I mean, no, no, no. This, 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 is, this is one of the... So it's really a step-by-step yeah. step step approach. Okay. Uh, so we'll, we, we need to tick the boxes. That's, that's sure. what needs to happen. We need to tick the boxes. And, I mean, at A4E, we take a very pragmatic approach. So if we, we will actually assess our success on having ticked those boxes for a more uh, efficient airspace. Because come summer... My, my board of CEOs will say, well, well Thomas, you, this is wonderful. Probably ask the same questions okay. as you have. What have you done? All right. And more importantly, how, how has this impacted positively okay. now our, our, um, our traffic? So, so Thomas, we, we've, we've got five minutes left. Yep. So, so the way this works normally is I ask everybody for closing remarks, but I'm not going to do it this time. I'm going to ask everybody a lousy question. Okay? So I'll start with you, Nicholas. Okay? You've got one minute, and your lousy question is, why are we spending $2 billion of taxpayers' money with SDM? What are you going to do for it? So it looks like your first question, so you corner me on this topic, but uh, yeah, well, uh, we are doing, and that's, I believe, the raison d'etre of César Deployment Manager, it's to be sure that this EU money, which is massively injected into ATM modernization, goes to the most efficient enablers, the ones that will bring back as short as possible, as quick as possible, the higher benefits. Uh, that's really, again, our raison d'etre. Um, sorry for quick answer, but I want to save some seconds for something very important to me. Uh, you said, Raphael, and was said also this morning, together. And as the leader of an entity which is based on the idea that, and the demonstration, everyday demonstration, that airlines, airports, and SPs can mm -hmm. work together, this word is extremely important to me. And because the title of this panel is Capacity, I'm fully aware of the difficult time we are going through. And I perceive from panel to forum, from forum to conference, that there is temptation 
because of this difficult time, to go back to old confrontations. You got 10 NSPs, seconds. NSPs, airlines, the good ones, the bad ones. Thank you. I think it's a dead end. Uh, we have to stay together even more, even right. more. Okay. And as DM, again, I want to say, uh, we are demonstration that industry has reached maturity to self-organize how to implement EU regulations. Okay, but I'm, and I look forward to the delivery. Okay, Thomas, you're, you're, you're paying top dollar for service, okay? If you don't get the service in 2019, if you have a summer that's worse than 2019, are you going to sit here on a panel this time next year and start worrying about 2020? What are you going to do? Look for another job. Uh, that's one of the answers. Uh, no, then, then we, we have a serious problem. Uh, um, uh, we have a serious problem, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident that at least we'll, we'll be able to work part of that list. And um, if we are able to manage some of these points, it will, it will, make, it will make things in the field better. Okay. Raphael, I, IATA represents ev everybody. What, what, what do you see, you know, the, the, the growth patterns over the next number of years? Do you, do you see more hubs growing point to point? And what do you see the impact of that on the network? Do you see a different way that maybe we could do business, you know, using different kind of business models for the airlines? And what I'm talking really about is the growth of point to point carriers, you know, Norwegian, say, Edinburgh to Pittsburgh. How does this work out for you? How, how do you think this will evolve? Well, I think, uh, again, uh, we already said that uh, everybody here has kind of agree that we have a big challenge, right? Mm. Um, I think, uh, and, and the big challenge is that we have an industry that is growing, and we're not able to cope with that growth in a sustainable way, right? Okay. Um, part of that growth is the area that you highlighted, point to point, but hub. I mean, we, we, we believe that uh, in, in competition, we believe, obviously, in, in having... Uh, the, the possibility to develop air transport. So we don't have a, a favorite uh, view in terms of, you know, hub or point to point. I mean, it's, we already see the connectivity in Europe being one of the best in the world, intra-Europe, right? Okay. So if we see that as, a, we see that as a, as a great benefit, and if that can be replicated worldwide, then, then fine. I mean, but we need to be uh, uh, much stronger in performance. You asked me before about being performance focused, right? And I fully agree with being performance focused, right? But it's very difficult to, I guess, uh, you know, be performance focused when you said before that we are paying for something, we are not getting that something. But at the same time, you know, maybe, you know, those if the companies it, are making it. profits why, on that, why, right? Why, if you're paying for it, you're not getting for it. Why do you keep paying for it? Because there is no choice. <laughs> right? Okay, <laughs> Catherine, if I could ask you, your nasty question is okay. Why are we building this runway at, at Heathrow? It's much cheaper to build it at Gatwick, cheaper in Stansted. So wh why, why are you doing it in Heathrow? I know that you own the airport, but, but why, why not? Oh, oh, it does this make sense? You're knocking 500 houses, relocating the M25. I mean, it's a massive project. Turkey rolled an airport out in four years uh, with five runways. You know, what do you think? Build it in Gatwick or Stansted? There's been clear, uh, clear support for the runway at Heathrow through the MPS statement yes. and the vote um, in Parliament that was won by an incredible majority. Um, for the GDP and for UK PLC, it is the only place where we have um, seen Gatwick, uh, okay. Stansted uh, try and fail to become a hub airport and Heathrow is the only option to drive that hub. Okay, but, but is it value for money, Catherine? I, uh, I mean, Willie Walsh, the CEO of IAG, he he's not wouldn't be the number one supporter of the second runway at Heathrow. Uh, and I've, alri I've already mentioned the cost challenge. We are working in, uh, very closely with all of the partners um, that we need to um, assist with investment into Heathrow, and we're listening. We absolutely accept that there is an affordability challenge, and everything okay. that we are doing just now is to drive the cost of the third runway down. All right, okay. And Maurice? My bad question for you is, how can we get French air traffic controllers to work more harder? <laughs> Sorry, more productively, come out, work, okay? There you go. First of all, NSP work for aviation, not against. No, it's true. This, no, this, yeah, this, I would this is their this. raison. They, they don't have extra resources, uh, duty yeah. freeze, and so like that. The only thing they do is working for that. So they do work for that. 
Uh, the problem is that, of course, they have a, a kind of lever, and we don't want to be back in, in this situation where, due to a lack of air traffic controllers, they, had, uh, they have a, a negotiating uh, power which is stronger than it should be. So we have to stabilize RP3 so that we, uh, we are not back in this kind of anti-cycling si system in which it's uh, uh, too difficult to negotiate anything. But 2019 should be the year, not to, should be the year to pave the future, and it's the appropriate time with RP3 preparation. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, thank you for staying with us for the last hour. I hope you, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, particular thanks to Nicholas, Thomas, Raphael, Great. Last word to Heathrow. Because uh, I, feel, I, felt like, I felt I gave you a bad question. Well, we do have Perhaps a plan. We, do, we are planning for Brexit. It's not in the lap of the gods. And um, so I guess I just want to come back to that, that okay. question. Okay. All right. So, um, and thanks, Catherine. And thanks to Maurice. So thank you, guys. And um, thanks to everybody. We'll, we'll step thank down you. after thank you. Thanks. 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 Than